Today's lecture, we're going to look at some broader concepts in American history. Uh, we will talk about some specific historical moments and, and uh, factors in early American history, but I also want to look at some broader analytical frameworks from which to look at all of American history. And in particular, we're going to look at the ideas of one historian and see if we can put them into practice and see what kind of value we can get from them. And what I want to start with is uh, an idea, a phrase you may have heard thrown about on the news or from other academics, and it's, it's the word American exceptionalism. American exceptionalism. And it can mean a lot of different things. Uh, it's often misused. Usually, in academic history, early American historians or any American historians, when we talk about American exceptionalism, we're not saying that America is better than other places. It's not an argument that somehow our culture, our society, our style of politics exceeds those of others. Rather, it's an analytical argument about there's something in American history, some sort of factors or events that make it different, right? That make a, our culture, our society, our economics, our politics, a divergence from other Western civilizations, right? That, that there's a reason to look at American history as distinct from other histories, particularly other European and Western civilizational histories. Because there are other historians who argue that's a, that's a poor way to look at America. We should always have America in this more specific global or Western context, that it's not really all that different in terms of its history and the society it produces. I, I'll lay my cards on the table. Uh, I teach American history because I'm on the American exceptionalist side. Not everyone has to be, but I do think that there are certain events, certain factors in, in American history, particularly early American history, that creates a divergence where, you know, uh, there's a different shoot off of the, the vine of Western history where American history resides. Yes, we're part of Western culture and certainly part of global culture, and there's lots of commonalities, but there are certain facets uh, that are unique and they play out in contemporary American society and they find their antecedents in early American society. And we're going to try to find the, the roots of one of those today. You know, one of the areas, and it'll be important for what we'll talk about today, is the role of class, particularly class conflict in American society, in American history. Um, you know, one of the things that historians might argue in America, there's obviously divisions in classes, and there has been class tension. And by class, I should be quite clear. We're talking about uh, an, uh, an economic social division between upper wealthy classes, you know, powerful political classes, and laboring classes and middle classes, right? We've, these are economic definitions, but basically your level of wealth and political power and those who are like you and have similar levels of wealth and political power form your class. And, <clears throat> you know, American history, and people will point this out, we have a curious relationship between the classes. That while there is tension from time to time, and, you know, recently in the news we hear more about the tension between the classes, and yet American civilization has lower amounts of tension between the poorer classes and the wealthier classes. Our wealthy pay the lowest taxes in the free world. And even more curious is people in the middle and the lower classes often identify culturally, politically, uh, their future view of what they want from America with the ideals of the upper classes, right? That there is this, this very interesting link, and it is not in all cases, and it can be overgeneralized, and yet when compared to European history, both contemporary Western European history and European history for the entirety of it, we have a lot less class tension, a lot less class um, definition. And the roots of that, and like I said, we can see it in, in, our, in our taxing policies, in our labor law, it's really quite a bit different from how it's resolved and how it presently plays out in modern America. And most societies, 
right? Most societies and most times, if we look at most history, have some level of class tension, right? And these class tensions between the rich and the poor, um, you know, usually they just sort of reside. They're not, in most cases, uh, open hostilities. However, in times of crisis or war, and certainly in times of revolution or a natural catastrophe, you know, these real flashpoints, we often see these class tensions bubble over and become the defining aspects of a particular era of history as one class struggles against another, often violently. And, you know, the reason they have these class tensions, um, you know, it, it's a problem that goes back from the very beginning of civilization to the first pharaonic, you know, civilizations, is that there's always these tensions when you have a civilization where the many are compelled to work for the few, right? That the divisions created on that and the inherent oppression to make that relationship happen creates these class tensions. And that's a simplification, and yet, you can, you can find these elements in almost any history, any society, and any civilization. And as I wanted to say, uh, you know, sometimes there is a mythical telling of American history that suggests there is no class tension at all, or that somehow egalitarianism, this belief in, in absolute liberty, has made all of us equal. And of course, that's, that's not true, right? There are stark class divisions in America. Uh, there are entrenched differentiations of wealth and corresponding social power that goes with that wealth. And that has existed in American history from its very founding and until the present times. But, and this is, I think, I posit that it's true. And you know, you can argue against this. You could come up with examples against it and I encourage you to do it. But for the case of this lecture, I believe that often it seems to be they're lacking in American history, especially early American history, uh, is that sort of open angst and hostility between the laboring classes and the elite landowning classes. And more startling still, and this is, this is true, is that often the lower and middling classes will, will wed together their social interests with those of the elites. They will place themselves firmly under the political control of the, the elites, willingly, and they will uh, embrace their political le leadership they will enshrine the culture of the political elites, their economics, their political goals, um, and they will make the political goals and the attitudes of the elite landowning class their own political goals. And we'll talk about that in some specifics in a, in a minute. The, the question we're going to address today is why. Why does this happen in America? Colonial America, early national America? Why do the laboring and market farming classes join up with the merchant classes of New England and the landed arist aristocratic plantation owners of Virginia? And listen, they join up with them and they will engage in a seven-year deadly struggle against the English king and parliament during the American Revolution. Four score years later, poor subsistence farmers will actually lay down their lives in acts of, of martial valor by the tens of thousands, uh, you know, on the behalf of a planter class and the institution of slavery, uh, whose very existence excluded them from the competitive labor markets of the region and enshrined their, their persistent poverty and social marginaliz marginalization. And yet, they give up their lives to defend it in a common cause, and they saw their cause as common with the elites, and vice versa, I might add. And again, it's bringing it into contemporary times. Why do, you know, the wealthy in America, which is a popular egalitarian republic, uh, a democratic republic, you know, still pay the lowest marginal tax rates in the world? All of these factors are connected, right? They are all part of a curious, exceptional American historical culture. Because all culture, all things that exist now are the product of history. Take a little bit of a divergence here. I just want to talk about academic historians. You know, historians, especially academic historians, have, have a curious idiosyncrasy. Um, you know, though their lives, and my lives, are dedicated to recovering and preserving the values of stories long, long past, you know, there's often a hostility among academic historians uh, towards 
histories and historical theories that are more than 10 years old. You know, uh, when you're in graduate school, what you'll do is you'll often be taught uh, to know and read historians from a time past, understand whatever their theory was or their model or their mode of analysis, but really all you then do is catalog it, put it into a larger historiography, and move past it, often uh, learning to make arguments to show how future, more modern histories, more recent historiography undoes or challenges or expands upon these past theories. You know, they, they sort of lose their luster and, and their power. And lost in that process is many, many salient and fairly brilliant critical analyses uh, of history that are no less pertinent now than they were 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago. And I, I'm going to try to recover one that was written 40 years ago. It's still actually fairly popular among certain groups of American historians, uh, but I, I find it very, very pertinent to what we're talking about in this chapter. Almost 40 years ago, uh, a great early American historian, Edmund Morgan, wrote one of the most engaging and, and daring theories to explain why, during the American Revolution, the laboring elite and the urban merchant class together uh, proclaimed with passion and persuasion their shared commitment to individual liberty, democracy, and egalitarianism. You know, he, he marveled uh, at the commitment that even the wealthiest classes had uh, towards promoting, sometimes with their very, their very lives, um, these revolutionary societal values on behalf of the middling and lower classes. During the revolution and, and even afterwards, you know, the middle classes would continue to look towards these elites to defend their rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And I should say that Morgan's not the first one to, to wonder about this class relationship, right? Why in America, in our revolution, right? It isn't a peasant revolution. It's not just a colonial revolution against a, uh, what is seen as a foreign power, but it's this, this really unique wedding between uh, a class of haves and another class of have-nots that believe they have common cause, common identity, so much so they're willing to fight and die to promote that common identity. And it sustains itself after the revolution. You know, we see revolutions throughout history where the wealthy will lead on behalf of the poor, and usually when the revolution is over, that's when the class conflict really erupts. I mean, that's the story of the French Revolution, right? And uh, the French Terror. The American Revolution resolves itself by not undoing the bond that, that made the revolution possible. Instead, it resolves itself by recommitting themselves to this unique, curious culture where the lower and the middle classes share, share a common cause and identity with the elite classes, that they, they really mitigate the idea of class tension and, and conflict. And <clears throat> what makes Morgan's point really unique? Isn't that he observed this, right? Other historians have talked about it. But it's, he makes a real departure from prior historical explanations for why this happened, right? And where he puts the explanation of where we can find the historical reasons and how we got to this point is also important for what we're talking about in this chapter. He places it right in early Virginia, right after the aftermath of Bacon's Rebellion. And even more importantly, I, we have to talk about today, he connects it to another institution uh, that existed alongside of it, and that is the rise of black African slavery in the colonies and in the early national period. Let's back up a little bit on slavery here. You know, again, this is not something that Morgan was the first one to notice, but he makes a, a, a very great connection, which we'll talk about. One of the big questions is this. We have these incredibly high-minded ideals being put forth by Jefferson and the other colonial leaders. Um, and True ideals, right, of egalitarianism, liberty, the rights of the individual against exterior powers that are enshrined by God and time themselves, that can't be overturned. And they believe these ideals, right? They really do fight for them, and they make them happen. And yet at the same time, often by the same men who espouse these ideals, we have uh, the greatest and, and the last true testament to unfreedom, non-liberty, right, oppression, and that is 
uh, the enshrinement and the expansion of black African slavery in the American colonies and in the early national period and beyond. You know, the very idea, and I should say, and it wasn't just a small aberration. We have to understand that slavery, slaves rep represent 20% of the population at the time of the revolution, 20%. One in five people in the colonies and in America are black African slaves. And they aren't all on plantations in the South, they are in every single colony. There are urban slaves, there are small farming slaves, okay? They're everywhere. Everyone is very conscious and, and, and of slavery. And Africans and their status are very, very present in everyday public life for everyone. They're aware of this. And Morgan calls this the American paradox. A paradox is when two things exist at the same time that seem completely uh, contrary. It's hard to explain how they could exist at the same time. That's a paradox. It's an existence in time of two things that seem inimical to one each other. And at the very moment, the very moment we are making one of the grandest and most lasting statements of egalitarian liberty, of the individual rights of the person, right, and writing them down into law and bleeding across the ground to sustain them at that very moment, and they really did it, they meant it. They are also propping up, profiting from, and sustaining the most oppressive uh, removal of rights of human beings in the world at that time. Right? They, slavery and freedom exist side by side in the minds of the same people, in fact. And Morgan, again, he's not the first one to call attention to that, and he certainly isn't the last either. However, he put slavery into this story, into the story of how class tensions are lessened and this sort of unification between the ideals and the culture and, and the goals of the elites and the commoners and the lower class, right? he says slavery isn't incidental to that story, it's the cause of the story. It is the most important part of the story. It's the part, not only can we not splice it out, right? you have to really understand what it did for that society. You know, I should say, like most historians, and again, I want to put this into historiography, because when we look at history, we have textbooks, you have my lectures, but it is the product of, of, of academics and scholars who write and argue, all right? And sometimes looking at the exact same set of facts, we have a completely different opinion. That's the beauty of academics and the humanities, right? There's the, the role of human imagination, intuition, and rationality, right? And so other historians looked at this, and they just said, well, men like, yes, it is a paradox, slavery and freedom. And the way they explained it is, Jefferson, in some ways, guys like Jefferson is a visionary, right? He's a man beyond his time. But we have to also accept, eh, shrug their shoulders. He's also a man of his time. He was, it, it is unfortunate that in spite of his, his uh, enlightenment, visionary, passion and zeal for the, for the rights of the individual, right, he was, he was stubbornly blind to the realities of slavery or how inimical slavery was to that. However, you know, the very ideals that uh, come out of the revolution will ultimately be the ideals that undo slavery, right? That those ideals will be ultimately expanded, right, to include those who weren't included at the time of the revolution. And, you know, whether or not we choose to fault uh, the leaders of the revolution morally, uh, as well as just sort of socially and historically, is up to individual historians. But Morgan has a very different take on this. So now we're going to move back into uh, a little bit of history. And as I said, what he really wants to say is this, is that I should say Morgan states, because I wrote this down and I, I think it comes out clear, and I'll just sort of recap what I've said. Morgan states that slavery, far from being paradoxical or anomalous, and anomalous means uh, something, a phenomenon that you can't explain. It seems out of context. Anomalous to the revolutionary ideology he says it actually made that ideology possible. He said that the institution of slavery gave birth to the unique common cause and identity of the wealthy, middling, and poorer white men here in America. Slavery doesn't undermine revolutionary freedom. It enabled it. So now how does that work? Morgan isn't a philosopher. He puts this in a very historical context. And, he, and the historical context where it starts is starts where we're talking in this chapter. And it starts at the end of Bacon's Rebellion. Bacon's Rebellion uh, is, goes from 1675 to 1676. 
I'm going to give you a quick recap of Bacon's Rebellion. We're not going to go through the heavy details, just so we know what it was. We've talked a lot in previous lectures about the, the way Virginia society works, right? And Virginia society was this, this kind of harsh economic system where you have indentured servants who are bonded to the land, right? And when they, when they finish their servitude, they sort of get cheated, right? The planter class really can't give them good land. There isn't that much. And if they get any land at all, assuming they even survive their indenture because the death rates are so high, it's far off in the countryside, removed from rivers, from the wharves, from the shipping, from the economics, from the social stability and success of that society. And they become these backcountry freedmen, the ex-settlers. They're armed. They're still Englishmen. They have some rights. They own land. At best, they're subsistence farmers. Remember, there's not even enough women to go around. And by that, I just mean marriage, right? That part of every community's life is marriage and family. I mean, it's something that grounds you, that makes you forward-looking. Well, most of the freedmen are cheated out of that as well. One in six or somewhere between one and eight, depending on which historian you look at, is the ratio of men to women in colonial Virginia in the 17th century. And so we have in the countryside this ever-growing mass, right, of uh, ex-indentured servants who are angry, who are cheated, who have very few prospects Okay? There's very little they can look forward to in this society. They're armed, and they can't even compete for labor because the, the plantation owners have a need. They have a need for a very cheap, easily oppressed labor source, right? And they get it through immigration. No matter how badly they treat everyone, because of the conditions in London, because of the advertising they do to lure people in, there's always more indentured servants, right? So they can't compete with that incoming flux. And, you know, generally speaking, they have a lot of class angst, a lot of hatred, a lot of tension towards this planter class that lives so well in these mansions along these wharves in Jamestown that they are completely excluded from. And nothing much comes of that angst for a long period of time because they're not organized. They live outside of, of of the main uh, area of Virginia society. What happens is this, is that by the late 1670s, there is a lot of clashes between these backcountry settlers, the ex-servants, the freedmen, and the Powhatan Indians, the various Indian uh, groups that live around them. You know, and they keep expanding further and further into territories that have been set aside or agreed upon uh, as being specifically Native American territories. But the backcountry settlers want land. They say, hey, listen, if we get anything else, we want to be able to farm and hunt and settle on this land. And of course, this leads to conflict. And the problem with the conflict from Virginia's point of view, particularly from the governor's point of view, who represents imperial interests, is, hey, this is, uh, upsets the balance, right? It creates chaos. It creates violence, which we don't want. We've talked about this in previous lecture. It also messes up the fur trade, you know, uh, along with the plantation economy, there actually is a, a burgeoning fur trade. It's a trade in deer skins between the Powhatan Indians uh, and the colonial governor and, and his representatives. And it's fairly lucrative. It's, it's a lucrative side business to the plantation economy. And uh, there's a lot of things that happen. But as these tensions really ramp up, what happens is the governor and the council take the side in the eyes of these backcountry settlers of the Native Americans, right? They uh, proposed several different policies that would limit their expansion, that would prevent them from making war on the Native Americans, and they probably should have would have just been angry and resentful, but what makes something happen is one guy, a guy named Nathaniel Bacon. Now, Nathaniel Bacon had arrived in the colony in 1774. He is one of those rising wealthy noblemen from the cities in London who's brought over to be part of those first families, which we talked about in a previous lecture, right? And he's a little different than the other first family guys, though. Or maybe he's similar. He's ambitious, right? And he, they give him a plantation. He's very popular. He's, he's very charismatic. He's a great speaker. People like him. He's young. But he wants more. And he sees a wonderful opportunity in this brewing problems out on the frontier. And, and what ultimately happens is, is he takes the sort of general class resentment and anger and frustration of this 
this settler, ex-servant, freedman class in the frontier and focuses it into a uh, class, an anti-wealthy class ideology. And what he'll ultimately do is he will lead a large band of volunteers who are all these, these, these backcountry settlers as an army against Jamestown itself. He will actually uh, launch a war against the planter class and the governor class of Jamestown, right? And in 1675 through 1676, Jamestown, you know, Virginia goes up in flames. It is a scene of chaos. Uh, Bacon and his backcountry settlers drive everyone out. And aside from just sort of taking over the colony, it's the way they do it. Virginia becomes this site of extreme, vexing, cathartic violence against all symbols of planter wealth and privilege. They burn and loot every single home they can find and, and every single planter who didn't flee, right? Any sign of the world that they had been excluded from, that they had been cheated uh, out of being part of, they destroy it in that really intense class-oriented anger. This sort of thing happens in history. It happens, I wouldn't say often in history, but there are these moments from peasant rebellions and all sorts of uprisings, you'll follow them, where that's what happens. They rise up and they really will focus their attention on uh, the symbols of the class that they are opposed to, that they were excluded from, that they were oppressed by. And Bacon's rebellion is no different. In fact, it's, it's wildly violent and chaotic. Um, it falls apart. Mostly it was doomed to fail anyway. I, I mean, the British the government would never allow this to go on for too long. Uh, Bacon himself dies. He kind of dies uh, a, a sad death. He dies of dysentery. Nothing noble or, or especially uh, exciting about that, but he dies of dysentery. As we know, uh, like everyone else in Virginia, he's subject to diseases, and disease and bacteria is a big problem and all through the 17th century for the leaders and the followers alike, and Bacon dies. And after he dies, um, you know, the Bacon's rebel, rebels really just become, you know, Bacon's mob. And they break off into smaller groups, marauding the countryside, uh, committing acts of violence. And really it sort of dies down. Later in 1676, the governor returns with British soldiers. They impose order, right? They restore the plantations. And, you know, that's the end of Bacon's rebellion. And Bacon's rebellion isn't notable because it's a successful rebellion or it was even politically significant or ideologically significant. In fact, in many ways, it was somewhat ordinary in, tar in terms of larger European and global history. What's interesting about Bacon's, Bacon's rebellion is what it leaves behind. It changes Virginia society, and it changes it in such a way that it'll change all of American society, according to Morgan, and it'll change the culture of America, particularly the class culture. And this is according to Morgan. And I should say, there is sort of a change, right, that we don't see this sort of class uprising, head-to-head -head like this, again, in American history until the 1860s, we'll see the draft riots in New York City, right, as immigrant groups really riot against being forced uh, to, to go and, and serve in the Civil War uh, on the behalf of, of a wealthy class, right? And then we don't really see this again um, until you know, the racial and the urban riots of the 1960s and the late 20th century. Like American history is surprisingly after this point, I won't say devoid of class tensions or of class violence, but certainly um, it is far more mitigated here in the American story after this. And we're going to talk about why. The practical realities are this. The planter class says, you know, we will always need a vast, cheap, mass labor source uh, to run these plantations, right? And to maximize profits. That the maximization of profits is still the number one goal of the planter class, no matter what else they do. And that has to come first. At first, we are planters. We are international businessmen selling, uh, trying to meet an almost insatiable demand. And to be more honest, the nature of the work was odious, right? It's hard work. Tobacco work is year long, and it's backbreaking work. It's backbreaking. It's hard to find people who are willing to do it willingly, right? Um, you know, this isn't the relationship of, of serfs to nobles throughout Euro European history, where they lived in villages and the pace of work life was a lot more settled. Oh no, they need a working labor class that they can 
drive really hard. They could force them to do long hours of odious work year long. And in order to do that, you have to have a labor class that you can oppress. Your labor class cannot have rights. They can't have too many rights. There has to be some amount of oppression built into the system to get people to do the work. And that's true for all the plantation economies. And while, and I said, this is a dilemma faced by all civilizations, right? Once again, it's, it's, the, um, it's the dilemma of when the, when the many have to be compelled or will be compelled to work on behalf of the few. The, the key to that system is a certain amount of oppression and a certain limiting of rights. And more specifically, in order for this to work, right, one group has to be oppressed and have their rights limits, limited, and by proxy, the other group will, you know, have their rights enhanced, right, broadened. But after Bacon's Rebellion in Virginia and Maryland, and then later in the Carolinas when they established their colonies and their plantation economies, um, they will completely turn their back on using white indentured servants from England. And they do this because of a couple of practical reasons. One, and this is the biggest one, you know, they knew they could never make good on the promise of land for work, right? And they knew that really this was at the heart of Bacon's Rebellion and all the resentment that there was an obligation. They couldn't meet the key economic obligation of the relationship. We have to deliver land that will hopefully enable the servant to be viable here in this colony, right? That's, that, that was the promise. They couldn't do it. There was only so much land, and they weren't going to give their own land to do this. So knowing that, they had to get rid of this sort of, any sort of labor relationship that had a mutual obligation. Also concomitant on that is they'd grown very wary of this growing mass of, of white ex-servants who were well-armed living on the frontier. They seen what happened when there was too many of them. After Bacon's Rebellion, they're not eager to bring in more of them, right? They, they have a very different view of these laborers now after their homes have been burnt and they've been driven out. And there's the third problem, which is even though the planter class could, could to a great extent legally oppress the indentured servants while they were bonded to them during their period of indenture, they couldn't entirely and completely and absolutely oppress them, right? They couldn't make them work forever. They had mutual obligations and contracts they were supposed to meet afterwards. And the servants, even while servants, still had rights as Englishmen and English women. They, did, they didn't give up their rights. You know, their remoteness from um, civilized London made it hard to sometimes exert those rights. But it was understood that they still had them. There were still cultural, cultural and social limits on um, how much you could oppress this class. And so, in truth, it was a labor class that could never be truly and fully subjugated to the planter designs and would eventually keep growing and create dangerous, violent, destabilizing class tension. And the way this is solved, and it's solved almost imme immediately, is the planter classes of Virginia, Maryland, and then uh, the Carolinas will go to the system already being used in the islands off of Africa and the sugar plantations uh, in the Caribbean and in Brazil, right? They will begin to use wholesale black African slavery. You know, there had been African slaves in Virginia as early as 1619, but their presence was very, very small. They represented an almost insignificant number of laborers of the laboring class in Virginia up until Bacon's Rebellion. But in the decades following Bacon's Rebellion, that's completely reversed. They begin to bring in and use exclusively black African labor. African slaves, and, and they do this obviously for practical reasons. One, you know, you could own the slave for life, right? The planters had no legal obligations to them. It's not a contractual relationship. It's a property relationship, right? They owed nothing to the slaves for their labor. They didn't have to set aside land. The slaves didn't, well, the slaves couldn't demand things from them or demand, you know, their needs are met, right? So this has eliminated one of the great problems they already had, economically speaking and socially speaking. Also, you know, English racism and its legal culture had defined black Africans as almost absolute others, 
you know, outside of the framework of legal rights and legal identity. And because of that, they are neither Christian nor Englishmen. They could be absolutely oppressed. There was really no limits on how much they could subjugate them and how long. No limits on the nature of violence or deprivation. Right? They would establish slave codes, but the slave codes were just to add some rationality to the system, not to protect the slaves. And in truth, you know, the, the Africans have no legal rights. They have no recourse. And this new relationship where uh, Africans, black Africans, are defined as absolutely others, absolutely oppressible, creates this new condition where people begin to think about culturally the meaning of whiteness and Englishness, right? That all of a sudden, more than ever before, even for the poorest subsistence farmer on the frontier, excluded from the economic uh, uh, dynamism of Virginia Colony, still had something to cling to, his identity as a white Englishman with inherent rights. He had inherent rights. No matter what else happened to him, he couldn't be oppressed or owned or sold or treated or thought of as black African slaves. And nothing, nothing makes you more clearly uh, aware of your sense of rights and self than to live in the presence of someone who has none of them, right? It, 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 it's in the truest sense of the word, it throws it into relief. And, you know, these rights as Englishmen, particularly as white Englishmen, became something that was far more uh, guarded, preciously guarded and promoted by the elite the middling classes and the poorer classes alike. We'll see that this kind of actually helps form the common identity. We are white Englishmen with rights. You know, and aside from addressing the long-term uh, concern of supplying a pliable, permanent, cheap, vast labor force for the planters, as I said, it also sets up the societal conditions to forge a new political, cultural, social bond between the freedmen, the ex-servants, and the wealthy planters and the middling classes. You know, with the end of the headright system, uh, no poor farmer looked to the wealthy, the elites, to provide them with land, to provide for their sustenance or their economic well-being. It was no longer part of the discussion, right? These guys were no longer, you know, as they're as over a generation, you know, were no longer accidentured servants, right? That they were now outside of that system completely, right? So they didn't make these demands anymore on the wealthy. When they turned to them with problems, the problem wasn't give us land and help us share in the wealth of this society. You know, and they was able to do this because of the presence of, of a new, completely oppressed, uh, omnipresent alien labor force, right? That because of that new presence in Virginia, the conditions of class tension between the poor classes, the poor white classes, and the elite planters are erased. They're removed, right? Slavery basically removed, removes the essential essence of tension between the classes, right? The necessary oppression of the wealthy classes to get the poorer classes to work for them. And, you know, it's not only erased in Virginia, right? It gets erased in all American colonial plantation society. And because it's erased, now we have this, 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 this flowering right of the, uh, the first families, right? They brought over these guys, you remember from the last lecture, to be the new nobles, these ambitious, wealthy urban guys who came over to be plantation owners and act as nobility in the new world. And part of that idea, we, if we recall, I'm gonna write it again, was the French word, it's noblesse, remember, we remember, noblesse, oblige, right? It's French, means a noble obligation, right? And once again, that was the idea that the wealthier classes would make sacrifices and show care and concern and leadership to the lower classes. It's part of your obligation as a noble. You know, they uphold your nobility, they support you as the leaders, and yet, it's a mutual relationship. And that, unlike the economic relationship of Virginia, was one that this class of people was willing and able to make good on. They could actually act on behalf, politically and socially and culturally, of the, the poor classes, but not economically. The economic had been cut out. 
But that's the real essence of class tension. It's not cultural tension, it's economic tension. It's the haves and the have-nots, which they still remain the have and the have-nots. But the attitudes about them have changed. And this new wealthier class, and this kind of comes back to that, that essential uh, colonial dichotomy, right? They will reshape themselves as defenders, defenders of the rights of white Englishmen, particularly the rights of the poorer and middling class farmers. And they would. And where they would play this out was usually in arguments against imperial powers, right? So that when these poor farmers wanted land or wanted to expand uh, or, or we felt their rights were being infringed upon, the leaders in the House of Burgesses and other assemblies, these wealthy guys, would argue on their behalf. And they'd say, you can't treat the poorer classes this way. They have inherent rights as Englishmen. And they could grant them these inherent rights now, and they could uphold them, because they no longer needed to oppress them so absolutely to make them work for them, because they had black African slaves with no rights they owned permanently. Right? The presence of slavery removed the thorn of oppression for whites that made mandatory plantation labor, right, sustainable. And, you know, what this leads to, and, it, and uh, just so I wanted to draw a little diagram just to kind of restate this idea. I was trying to think of a way to do this visually, but we'll say what came before. You have the planters on top, right, who put pressure, and oppression down, right, on the servant class, right? These are the white servants. And in theory, right, they were supposed to, um, you know, give them land and include them, but it doesn't happen that way. After they're done, you know, the servants keep coming out here, and they're, you know, they settle outside of this framework. And the problem is new servants are constantly coming in. And so you have this oppression here. This is a unified, locked economic system in which the labor of the servants leads to the wealth and the power of the planters. However, at the same time, it's creating this external group that has demands on the planters that they can't meet. And eventually, when the numbers get great enough or the conditions are right, these pressures collapse the planter society, right? Cause it to implode in Bacon's Rebellion in this cathartic, uh, over-the-top expression of violence and hatred towards all things planter class. The difference in slavery is this. Again, we'll put the planters at the top, and this never changes. It doesn't change. The wealthy are always at the top in the 17th, 18th, 19th, 20th, and 21st centuries. You have the planters again, right? Now the oppression goes like this. They double down on Africans. And the truth is, the Africans are locked in this system. There's no obligation. They don't have to let them go. They can't make any demands coming back. It doesn't happen. Right? Because of oppression, they're able to limit this. There are you know, uh, certain slave uprisings, but not very many. Not very many in America. Not as many as you would think. It has to do with numbers as part of it. And it's also the extremity of this system. Now, out here, you have the planter classes. I should say the settler classes, right, the poor farmers, who make demands on the planters, but now the demands are cultural and political, right? We want you to represent our rights, cultural, political, and the planters are actually able to meet those, right? It's, it's a reciprocal relationship. You support us as your political leaders, we'll support your rights. In fact, we'll give verse to your rights and expression to your rights on a more uh, powerful and passionate level than had ever been done before in human history. And in fact, that stabilizes the society, right? There's no longer pressure coming in. But, and it's a bit of a ruse because what it allows is that this economic system becomes enshrined, locked in place, right? The settlers, the backcountry ex-servants, the poor whites, they never get in on this. They remained, by and large, the poor whites up until the Civil War and afterwards. And yet, they feel, believe they have a common commitment to sustain this economic system, right? This very economic system that makes them poor, that excludes them. They can't, at no point in time, do they ever compete with labor, right? Because that's really how they would have gotten wealthy, having a way to compete in the labor market. No, they're shut out of it. They're completely shut out of the economics 
of the plantation-driven economies. And because of that, and because that's where all the focus is, they remain poor. And yet, the planters are able to sustain them by forging this political and cultural identity. And the thing that holds all of it up is this new conception thrown into relief by the presence of oppressed, enslaved black Africans is this new idea of English whiteness and rights, this sort of English whiteness with inherent rights, that these are how our rights are expressed. The individual has rights that just come along with English and whiteness. And I should say, the planters over time, over the course of the next century, and these leaders do end up being men like Jefferson, a planter who doesn't just do this for political expediency, he really is gifted and passionate and sincere in his expression for the rights of everyone, these rights of all men, right? That's how he would phrase it. And, and we've extended it over time to be all people, but you know, uh, that the rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, right, are fundamentally English rights and white rights. And the reason why we can have the relationship that, that promotes and sustains this, right, is because the planters no longer need to oppress the other classes. They can be the nobles. They can have noblesse oblige, right, because of this dark and terrible relationship. The common bond, that the wealthy would be the natural leaders of white society, and they defended the rights of the lower class against incursions of king and parliament, parliament and governor and council, or any of the interests of the empire. Right? Often, that's how rights are expressed, that you know, these, the poor classes, the middling classes, they want to be smugglers if they're the middling classes in coastal cities. They want land, whatever it is. They want uh, special arrangements when they serve fighting in the army against the French. Right? They want to be treated differently. And the way that they're treated differently is they claim to have essential rights as individuals. And these rights are mostly argued for and defended by politically uh, and culturally and socially this elite class. That's where it comes from. And it does, it does form this unique common bond. This, I won't say completely devoid of class tension because that would be foolish and it's also not true, but seriously lessened class tension that enabled a unique allegiance of classes, white classes, to not only launch a successful revolution, right? But to stay together after that revolution, to stick to those ideals and create a fairly dynamic powerful, centralized national government predicated on those ideals with a Bill of Rights. And again, I always use this as an example because it really plays into relief in Southern society. Why do the poor subsistent farmers right, fight on the behalf of uh, the wealthy plantation owners in the Civil War? Right? Because as, as historians often put out, economic historians, they knew they're shut out of this system. This system makes them poor. Right? makes them politically powerless. And yet, they saw themselves as having this common identity, a racial identity, a rights, individual rights identity, a, un, a combined identity of sustaining the society that oppresses the Africans. Right? And they fight and die for it, as I said, with acts of valor. Right? That's, that part of the Civil War is true. And you know, no historical theory is all-encompassing uh, or, or, or provides all the information. It just can't. But I do think that there's something to what Morgan says. It, it sheds some meaningful light, gives us a glimpse on how did this happen? What created this moment of American exceptionalism? The final thing I want to say is this. It's just kind of coming back to this theory itself. <clears throat> you know, when the theory was first introduced back in the 70s, it was hypnotic. Uh, it was powerful. It was persuasive. People fell in love with it. It showed up within five years in every textbook published. And it still shows up in some of them. Um, but over time, it loses its luster. Other theories have come to the fore, and rightfully so. I would argue this, and I, I'm not going to give you the answers here. I want you to think about this. Take what you already know about early American history, and keep in mind this theory as we learn more. I want you to say, where does this theory work? What sustains this? What seems to prove 
or be consistent with what Morgan argues is the essence of American notions of freedom and how it happened and why it enabled itself, right? And the connection to slavery. But there's lots of instances where it breaks down, where it makes no sense at all, where clearly other patterns at, are at work. Older established patterns, new patterns, different concerns. You know, sometimes, I'll give you this one, is everywhere a Virginia plantation civil society? Right? You have to kind of look at the broader view, too. Yet, there's something to it. As I said, I'm a believer in American exceptionalism. And so these arguments that try to point out where America's history gets exceptional to create a different, not a completely, entirely different, but a divergent path from general Western or global history, well, I find those enticing and worth knowing, which is why I'm sharing them with you in this lecture. And finally, in the end, uh, I, you have to be the interpreter of history. You have to interpret what you know. This is a theory I've given you. I hope you have your own, and I hope you read more and learn them and try to apply them. The basic question is this. This is what it comes down to with Morgan. Was Jefferson's phrase, when he wrote it, that all men are created equal, the inspired expression of an enlightened man who unfortunately remained stubbornly blind to the realities of slavery? Or was it, as, as Morgan might, might have suggested, uh, an expression of liberty forged by the adoption of African slavery and the persistent use of slavery by men like Jefferson himself? That's the end of this lecture. I hope you've enjoyed it.